has been preached so far this weekend, I want to talk to us about one of the words from that passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 that we've been hearing. And you know, we've, we've heard it Friday night, Saturday night. It says, if my people, Amen. which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Pray. I want to talk to us about that word, prayer. James chapter 5 verse 15 says, And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins, your faults, your sins to one another. And pray for one another. So that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. King James says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again. The sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and ministry of his word. You only see one time in the Gospels it referred to Jesus angry. Now, we we think of anger and we think anger is sinful, but anger is not sinful. The Bible says you can be angry and sin not. Anger can have an appropriate place and appropriate outlet and you see that one time in the gospels related to Jesus and it's when he goes in and he sees that the church has become something it's not supposed to be the church is about money and merchandising and business and Jesus turns over the tables and he says My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. This tells us where the Lord blesses with His presence. It's not because we call it the house of God that it's the house of God. It is when we make it a house of prayer that it becomes His house. Scripture is filled with commands and encouragement to pray. Jeremiah chapter 29 says, You will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Psalms chapter 10 says, You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their prayer. Isaiah 30 says, The Lord will hear your crying. He will comfort you. When He hears you, He will help you. Isaiah 55 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call to Him while He is near. Isaiah 91 says, 
The Lord speaking, He will call upon me and I will answer Him. I will be with Him in trouble. I will be- deliver Him and honor Him. The need of the hour that we're living in is for powerful, persistent, passionate, prevailing prayer. And I'm afraid that we talk about prayer, we teach about prayer, we post about prayer, we make prayer requests, but we really don't pray. There is a need in our nation for a praying church. There is a need in our community for a praying church. The Lord will bless His presence upon a praying church. The moral fiber of our country is becoming unraveled. Real love and compassion have almost become non-existent in a world that's only filled with lust. Confusion and upheaval, even in the religious community. There was a survey done of people that say they're born-again Christians. 44% of born-again Christians don't believe in an absolute right and wrong. 9% of born-again teenagers is 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 the only group that believes that there's an absolute right and wrong. One out of eleven that say they're born again. We're not talking about outside the church. This is in the walls of those that say they have been washed in the blood that don't believe there's an absolute right and wrong. If ever Christians needed to learn to prevail in prayer, it's now. We are involved in the fight of the ages. The warfare. It is described by Paul as a spiritual warfare against rulers of darkness, wickedness, evil forces all around us in governments and administration, all of these. And the only way that we can defeat this power of evil that wants to destroy us, destroy our families, destroy our lives is through the power of prayer. I read a story Paul Harvey told several years ago. There was a three-year-old boy who went shopping at the grocery store with his mom. And his mom said, when we get to the cookie aisle, you don't even need to ask for any chocolate chip cookies because we're not getting them. And she told him this several times while they come to the cookie aisle. And he can't hold himself back. And he says, Mama, can we get some chocolate chip cookies? And she says, I told you, don't even ask. Well, as she goes through the rest of the store, they get to the checkout aisle. And he realizes that this may be his last chance if he's going to go home with any cookies. And his mom has already told him, no, don't even ask, don't even ask for any cookies. Well, at the top of his lungs, he says, Mama! In the name of Jesus, can we have some chocolate chip cookies? The boy goes home with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies that other people around went and bought him. There's power when you pray in the name of Jesus, right? There are so many examples in Scripture of how powerful prayer is. Moses prayed and God spared Israel from judgment. Joshua prayed and God made the sun stand still while he defeated his enemies. Samson prayed and God gave him back his strength. Hannah prayed and the Lord gave her barren womb a son. Solomon prayed and God gave him wisdom. Elijah prayed and God sent fire 
down from heaven. Jonah prayed and God brought him out of the belly of the well. The thief on the cross prayed and the Lord saved him at his dying hour. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God and God threw open the bars of the jail and loosed them from their chains. There's so many examples that when we pray, God will do amazing things. There's an example in the book of Acts chapter 12. It tells us Herod, the king had laid hands on some of the church and had begun to mistreat them. And James, the brother of John, had put to death with the sword. When Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded and he arrested Peter also. He seized him. And he had him guarded by 16 soldiers intending to bring Peter out of prison for his trial after Passover. But on the night before he was going to trial, Luke tells us that the church prayed earnestly for Peter. Now, when we read about the, the church of the book of Acts, I think we look and we just notice some of the miracles and some of the great things that God had done. But we don't notice that this church had all kinds of trouble. Well, they had been having their preachers stoned to death. I don't know about you, but that kind of makes it hard to recruit a pastor. You tell, well, our last few, they've been killed by the community. But we'd love for you to come. The treasurer of the church had been swindling money and then finally committed suicide. They had some troubles. A prominent leader of the church had denied Jesus and been caught cussing. They were commanded by the government that they weren't even to speak in the name of Jesus and had been whipped and made publicly a spectacle. There was hypocrisy and lying in the church. There was racial strife that was causing murmuring between groups within the church. The favorite deacon, Stephen, had been stoned. And when I say stone, I'm not talking about the hippie 1970 version of it. This was some rough stoning. There was a government hitman, Saul of Tarsus, who was tracking down and killing anybody that was a member of the church. There was a conflict over who were they going to preach to. Peter had been out taught, caught preaching to the Gentiles. He was out preaching to the ones the church didn't want to reach. They had some troubles. We see all the miracles and we don't realize they got these miracles because they decided that they were going to pray through the troubles. That they weren't going to let the troubles of the time define them. That they were going to see what God might do in the midst of the problems. We might have trouble all around. We might have struggles and difficulty. We might have some challenges. We might have government that may persecute us. But if we'll get determined like the early church that we're going to pray through them. That greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world and that we can press through and pray through and see the power of God move. It was a messed up situation. And now, in spite of all those troubles, Herod decides that he is going to start messing With the church. It said he he stretched his hand and he began to vex, began to mistreat certain of the church. Well, he didn't do everybody. 
It is certain of the church. Which ones was he mistreated? I don't know. Maybe it was the folks that was making the most ruckus. The leaders, the teachers, the workers, the people out serving tables, the people out praying and going house to house, visiting, ministering. But he vexed certain of the church. He took their belongings. He put some of them in jail. He had some of them whipped. He had some of them beaten. But then he went beyond that. And it says he took James, the brother of John, and he put him to death. Killed him. You know, there's three of the inner circle disciples. There's twelve disciples that Jesus had with him during his earthly ministry. But there was three that you always see in that inner circle when he was in the garden. The three that... He took to pray with him that took a nap while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Peter, James, and John. And Herod kills James. Puts him to death with the sword. And now, seeing that that made his constituents, the Jews, happy, decides that he's going to take Peter. And if you read the way that that story started, your mind, if you didn't get the rest of the book, if you only got those few verses and that's where your copy of the book of Acts ended, and you had to fill in what happened in the cliffhanger, then you would have thought, well, that's how Peter died. He killed James, and now he's he's ready to... Go ahead and kill Peter. But Luke gives us this one little phrase. He says, while Peter was in prison, the church prayed earnestly for him. The church didn't call. Their leader was gone. They didn't call a business meeting. They called a prayer meeting. They didn't call a business meeting and say, well, maybe church, what we need to do is we need to find a leader that gets along better with Herod. Then he won't bother us so much. But they didn't call a business meeting to elect a diplomat. Instead, they called a prayer meeting. And Luke tells us that the church prayed earnestly. They knew that if God didn't do something, then Peter was going to be executed in the morning. They knew there was no way that they could bust him out because he had 16 soldiers guarding him. And so they prayed. You know, I've heard folks that when things get really bad, they, they say, well, now all we can do all we can do is, Lord, help us. It's come to the point where all we can do is pray. And saying that almost like, well, we might as well go ahead and give up hope. Write the obituary. Know that there's nothing more that can be done because all we can do, poor of us, is pray. But maybe persecution causes us to realize we can pray. Who knows what God will do? They didn't know if God was going to intervene. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they stood before Nebuchadnezzar, they said to him, We know our God is able to deliver us. We believe 
that God is able. We've seen God heal. We've heard the stories. We've got the testimony. We've seen God save. We've seen God deliver. We've seen God provide. We've seen God come through. We've seen the Lord work out miracle after miracle and we're still here. I'm surviving because God is faithful. I wouldn't be here if the Lord had not been on my side. Now may Israel say we would have been consumed. If the Lord had not been on our side, we wouldn't have made it here, church. If the Lord hadn't been on our side, there's some dark times we wouldn't have made it through. If the Lord hadn't been on our side, even before we were saved, God was protecting and God was sending angels and God's grace and His mercy were holding up our foot lest we slip. God was on our side and that's why we know that God is able to do what we we can't even imagine. And they prayed. Despite the outward attacks, they prayed. Peter was kept in jail. And they prayed. Now, when you see them praying, I hear folks say that, well, if you can't pray in faith, there's no need in praying. When I look at this Scripture in this passage, sometimes you don't have the faith. But I think this is a little bit of what the old timers talked about praying through. You may not start praying with faith, But if you pray long enough, you can pray until the faith comes. You can pray through your unbelief. You can pray through your discouragement. You can pray through your doubt. You can say, God, would you move? Lord, we need you to help Peter. God, And I, when, when I see what happens in this passage, I see that the, the, the believers, they're there praying. And while they're praying, God is moving. But they can't see what God's doing because they're praying in a different place. Sometimes when you're praying, you don't know what God is doing. Don't quit praying just because you don't see results because God may be doing something that your eyes cannot see. He may be doing something that's beyond your vision, beyond your hearing, beyond your senses, but God is still at work while we are praying. While they were praying, God sent angels. They're still praying. Lord, save Peter. God, don't let Herod kill him. Lord, you know he killed James. They're crying over James being gone. Lord, don't let them take Peter from us too. They're praying. And God is already working. He sends angels. Angels come, First Peter. The angels make the soldiers sleep. And wake Peter up. They make the soldiers fall into a deep sleep. Sixteen of them. Knocked out. And the angel, it says the angel had to stir Peter. Tell him, get up. Rise up. There's somebody been praying for you this morning. And maybe you're in chains and you don't know if there's hope or not. But God has sent His angels to tell you this morning, get up, rise up. You're not supposed to be in these chains. This death that you thought you were going to face, it's not for you. You don't need to stay there anymore. There's healing power. There's a move of God. There's a stirring of the angels. And God Almighty has sent an answer. And He's saying to you, get up from that discouragement. Get up from that doubt. Get up from that depression. Get up from that 
bondage. Get up. Rise up. The Lord is moving and God is answering and God is sending His miracle. And He says to us today, get up. Rise up. Don't sleep. Don't slumber. Don't stay in those chains. But rise up and see what God is doing. Hallelujah. Peter goes to the house where they're praying. And he knocks at the door. A young lady, Rhoda, comes to the door. <clears throat> and she sees it's Peter. And she goes back and she tells the prayer meeting, Peter's here! God's moved! Our prayers are answered! They're like, oh, poor Sister Rhoda. She done seen a ghost. She's having some kind of vision. She's seen Peter's ghost. Maybe the Lord's went up. And Peter is at the door. They're praying that God would release him. And he's there. Praying that God will set him free. And the Lord's already done it. I wonder, I mean, maybe, maybe some of them were praying, Lord, move on Herod's heart. When Peter comes to trial in the morning, make Herod change his mind. Make Herod feel merciful and gracious and set Peter free. But they had no idea what God had done. Paul says to the Ephesians, now to Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. According to His power that is at work in us. Hear me this morning. God might answer your prayer in a different way than you expect. He might blow your mind. Look at all the things that were, I mean, all, all the surprises in this. If you look at this passage and you see how it begins in Acts chapter 12, would you look at it and would you think that Peter is going to go free and that 16 soldiers are going to be put to death for losing him? Who would have thought that's how it was going to turn out? Would you think that Peter is going to live and Herod is going to be struck by God and fall down and be eaten by worms? Would you think that Peter's going to live and the soldiers are going to die and Herod's going to die? You just never know what God might do. When we pray. There's a church in South Korea. They give a little bit of a different meaning to prayer bells. I know Brother Willard sang the hymn Prayer Bells of Heaven on Friday night. This church it started... The pastor took the church about 50 years ago and they had 30 people. And the pastor said, you know, we're going to get two things right. Can't do everything, but we're going to pray and we're going to witness. And if we do those two things and do those well, then God will bless us. Well, I, I visited this church. They've got a prayer mountain. And they, um, this church actually believes that the reason North Korea hasn't bombed South Korea is because Prayer Mountain stands and overlooks that border. And they pray for God's protection over their country. And they believe that that's why their country has survived even though there's some crazy people running North Korea with all kinds of crazy weapons. They believe the difference has been prayer. When this church has prayer time, they have a bell on the pulpit. And when they say, here's the needs that we're going to pray for as a church, 
The people will go into fervent prayer. You'll see them. They're calling out to God. They're, 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 it's not quiet time prayer. It's loud time prayer. They're praying. They're travailing. They're groaning. They're crying out to God. And they would go on and do that for hours. But when it's time to move on with the next part of service, they take the bell and they ring it to let everybody know, okay, y'all prayed enough. We've got to get to preaching now. This church is the largest church in the world now. And if you go there, if you look at how the service is, it's not a whole lot different than any other Pentecostal church you'd go to. It's good teaching, good worship. They sing from the hymnals. They sing some contemporary. But people get saved all across their country. Because of what this church has done, South Korea has become the second largest missionary sending country just behind the U.S. Because of a church that prays. What would happen if we didn't just talk about praying, post about praying, Facebook pray, if we really became people of prayer. He said, my house is a house of prayer. If we long for God's presence in our church, in our homes, if we make it a house of prayer, it'll be His house. The Azusa Street Revival. Great move of God. The pastor of that movement, he didn't hardly get up and talk. He sat in a corner, humble man. They prayed. Prayer was the defining characteristic of the movement of the people of God. Have we forgotten? Have we lost a heart for prayer? He said, humble yourselves and pray. See, if we don't pray, we can never turn from our wicked ways. Because you don't have the strength in you to turn from your own sin. It's only in prayer that we get the power of God that can enable us to overcome the power of sin. The power of sin is stronger than we are in our flesh to overcome. But only through the power of prayer are we able to turn from our wicked ways. We have to become people of prayer. And what will God do when we make this house a house of prayer? What will God do when we make our homes a house of prayer? Will conviction fall in our neighborhood, on our families, when we pray? There is nothing more important in the life of the church. No ministry more important than praying. Now to Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work in us. God's power is at work. And if we will pray, let's see what He will do. I believe we can shed our wicked ways. We can give up habits that have bound us and bound family members for years and generations through the power of prayer. I believe that when we pray, that God will move, that God will touch lost people, that the anointing of God will so fill and permeate our lives. It will be contagious. Paul said, pray without ceasing. 
Now, I've, I've heard folks that would preach and say, you need to pray at least an hour a day. And I've heard others that say, you need to pray at least four hours every day. I've heard others say, you've got to pray eight hours every day. And you definitely need some time where you just get alone with God. I don't think you need a stopwatch on it. But what Paul says, pray without ceasing. We're always talking to God. We're praying when we get up in the morning. Praying when we're on the job. We're praying throughout the day. We're worshiping and thanking God as we go through our day. We're lifting up the Lord in every opportunity. We're praying and asking for God's help every time that we encounter anything. <coughs> praying. Sometimes even in our sleep. You ever woke up praying? Pray without ceasing. We don't ever open the door on the prayer closet and say we're done praying. We pray recognizing that without God's help we can't accomplish anything. But with His help we can do all things. I heard one guy say that I am so busy I don't have time not to pray. So much that we have going on that we would be much more effective at if we prayed. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Recognizing that God's help and God's Spirit can give us the strength and the power to accomplish great things as He works immeasurably, exceeding abundantly. Doing even more than we ask or imagine. This morning as we move through this revival and hear what God is saying to us, I want us to make sure that we don't miss that command from 2 Chronicles that God needs, He wants, He's calling us His people to pray. There's no substitute for praying. And we can't just depend on somebody else to do the praying. It's our turn. It's our turn to be the ones that pray through for this church. To pray through for this holler. To pray through for our families. And if we don't pray through, then they may end up in delusion by the enemy, deceived, carried away with this mass delusion of this age. But if we pray, God help us. Watch out and see what God will do. I'd love to hear from Brother Fess about how this church prayed when it was born. About how the people of God prayed through. I've been in some of those services. I've been in some of those ministers' homes where they would rise up before the sun and you'd hear them crying out to God and you'd hear the carpet was soaked in tears as they cried out to God and they prayed and they asked for God's help. If we're going to see God do what He's speaking to us that He wants to do in this revival. And that is heal our land. Help our community. Move in this holler. If we're going to see that, it's going to be because we humble ourselves and pray. This morning, as we close, I want to invite all of us to not just pray in the altar, but I want to invite us to repent for being prayerless. 
and to commit to God that we're going to be a people of prayer and that this church will be a house of prayer and that our homes will be a house of prayer and that God can inhabit us as we pray.